Good morning. Welcome to worship. Good morning. Good morning. I, I, I am happy to hear that you are alive, awake, and alert this morning for worship. So you should sing very loudly, and that is exciting. <laughs> A few announcements. Please read the calendar of the events coming up this week. We have the Scandinavian dinner coming up on Saturday. The BLCW's general meeting is on the 12th. And um, there's other things coming up in October. We have things coming on the calendar, uh, such as New Member Sunday, and then a Stewardship Sunday, October 30th, with uh, a special guest, the ELCA uh, Regional Gift Planner, coming. Uh, please read all those things in your bulletin for those announcements. Are there any other announcements people would like to share? All right, I invite Artie up at this time. Uh, we have been sharing each week from different decades in our church history about what happened during that decade to celebrate our 125 years of ministry. We are up to the 1930s. Um, in 1930, the question of building an addition to the church was considered by a committee. Um, some of the names on that committee were Subi, Carl Heltney, and O.K. Christensen, and there were women on the committee as well, Mrs. Hildo, Mrs. Lofgren, and Mrs. Gobbett. Um, they had some discussion on moving the church because of opposition. It was decided only to put in a new basement. In 1932, the men held their first fall supper, and it was a very successful one. Um, in notes from 1933, the secretary's book read, the treasurer and janitor are to look into buying all the wood needed for the church. So that was their responsibility. In 1934, the first Bethel Church Library was established. In 1935, reorganization of the whole parish took place, and the parish became one of Bethel, Bethlehem, and Zion with Nonestead to go with Badger. Nonestead was paid $100 for their share of the parsonage. Um, the following year, the resignation of Reverend Peterson happened, so a call was accepted, or a call was extended to and accepted by a Reverend Merwin Johnson, who would give services in English and in Norwegian. In April of that year, Dave Lofgren offered a house for sale um, as a parsonage for $3,000. The congregation accepted the offer and then sold the former parsonage to John Harper for $1,000. Now the first mentioned home later belonged to Ruth Egg and is now where Nick and Mary Becerra live. The latter is where Jane and Robert Harders eventually moved and is where I now live. In 1937, Pauly Church became part of the parish. Um, 1938, um, 1939, here we go, classes from school were being held in the Bethel Church, as well as other churches and the creamery, because the school building had burned on, a, on January 2nd of 1939. Thank you. Uh, Ed Bratton would also like to share this morning, and you can remain seated, just turn on the mic. I'm not uh, used to speaking into the mic, but uh, it is. Can you hear it? Nope. All right. I, uh, I want to thank all of you how nicely. Uh, they can't hear you. I want to thank yeah. all of you how nicely uh, you treated the need and me. And uh, this is my old church. Uh, this is where I attended Sunday school. I imagine I can remember back, I think, to about three years old. Uh, without any doubt, this is Fulman was probably my, well, definitely my favorite Sunday school teacher. And uh, anyway, uh, 
I was kind of surprised. I'd kind of been asked to maybe to speak today, but I guess we weren't really planning on it. And then I found out a few minutes ago, so I'll kind of wing it. <laughs> but uh, I've often wondered uh, what my life would have been and what I would have been if it hadn't been for this Lutheran church. Did you ever think about that? When you're a kid, uh, what if I'd never gone to a Lutheran church in my life, or any church? What have I been the same person? I really doubt it. Uh, I've had a really good life. Uh, I don't have any complaints at all because I lucked out, uh, and thanks to this church, I really, after I got out of the military, I uh, wanted to get on the state patrol, and I was fairly new riding with a real nice sergeant, and, and he told me we filled our patrol car with gas, and Jeff Everson, he always gave us patrol with a little discount in the gas and the patrol cars, and, and when we left, uh, and I had talked, and Jeff and I had a nice talk, and when I left, the sergeant said, you know, you would have never been a patrolman if it hadn't been for Jeff. And uh, I said, really? He said, oh yeah. He said, I did your background on you up there at Greenwood. And he said, when I asked Jeff about you, he said, Jeff said there is no person in the world that I'd recommend higher than Ed Brock. And uh, there were 4,300 people had applied, only 27 of us became highway patrol. Uh, so I was real fortunate and I, and hopefully I was a really good trooper. I, I think I was, but I'm not sure what some people thought I was. <laughs> I have to confess I traded everybody alike except Doc Klepsky. <laughs> Again, I shouldn't even mention this, but I think I'd be okay with him. I got him for way over the speed limit, and I, I couldn't write him. To. I know he'd saved my sister's life, and uh, and probably mine one time, and uh, I just couldn't write him a thing. And he asked me to write it. He said, Mommy, you go ahead and write it. I told him I can't do it. <laughs> so I can't say I treated everybody alike. Almost. Well, uh, I did write down a few things. Uh, without any doubt, Reverend Matthew said, was his, without a doubt, my favorite minister. And I remember, and this is something maybe to think about, I remember he made a real point to never let another church, if we left the church, to never ever let another church rebaptize us. And I've thought about that all my life. And I think he's right. But, uh, and uh, when I was on the patrol, uh, I flew out of the cities or Mankato the last seven years. And one of my jobs were hauling a, uh, some of the higher ups to different things. And I flew uh, one of the majors to Southwest Minnesota and. Uh, and uh, Lieutenant met me at the airport, and this other guy, and, and uh, he asked me, what would you like to do today? It's going to be a while, and I said, gee, I heard Mrs. Mathis had lived close by. So the sergeant took me over, and I got to spend a couple of hours with Mrs. Mathis, and I forget what her name was. I'm sure some of you older people probably remember Am I getting close in time? Yeah. I am. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to start my time up. Uh, thank you for letting me speak. And uh, 
This church is really a good church. <laughs> I've been in a room before with you, and I know that you could just keep going and keep going, so uh, we had talked about a time limit. <laughs> Today, as we hear about faith in our readings, not just any faith, a life-transforming faith, one that demonstrates the very presence of God moving, alive and active in God's people. The patience, tenacity, and endurance required for the life of faith are blessings received in holy baptism, holy communion, and the word read and proclaimed in this assembly. Anticipate them and receive them with thanksgiving. Please stand as you are able for our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who is eager to forgive and who loves us beyond our days. Amen. Dear friends, together let us acknowledge our failure to love the world as Jesus does. God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that sin is so
Let us pray. Benevolent and merciful God, when we are empty, fill us. When we are weak and great, strengthen us. When we are cold in love, warm us. Violence in the time leading up to the Babylonian exile moved this prophet to land. How can a good and all powerful God see evil in the world and seemingly remain indifferent? God answers by proclaiming that the righteous will live by faith. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen, or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack, and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks at the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Look at the proud, their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> we read together Psalm 37. Do not be provoked by evildoers. Do not be jealous of those who do wrong. For they shall soon wither like the grass. And like the green grass fade away. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. Take delight in the Lord. Who shall give you your heart's desire? Commit your way to the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord. You see what God will do. The Lord will make your vindication as clear as the light. And the justice of your case shall have been in the Be still before the Lord and wait patiently. Do not be provoked by the one who prospers. Refrain from anger, leave rage alone. For evildoers shall be cut off. The second reading comes from 2 Timothy, starting in chapter 1. This letter written to Timothy is a personal message of encouragement. In the face of hardship and persecution, Timothy is reminded that his faith is a gift of God. He is encouraged to exercise that faith with the help of the Holy Spirit. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois, your mother Eunice, and now I am sure it lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you to lay on of my hands. For God does not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and self-discipline. Do not be ashamed, then, of the testimony about our God or of me, his prisoner, 
or join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Jesus Christ before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher, and for this reason I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know that one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until the day that I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me, in the faith and love that are in Jesus Christ. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. The word of the Lord. Like that. 
Sometimes we hold other people's hands when we pray. So fold your hands. We're going to pray together. And we're going to pray for the people in our church that are maybe sick or in the hospital or they need a little help. We can pray for them, right? Yeah? All right. Repeat after me. <clears throat> okay? Can you do the eyes to that? You guys can do that too? Yes? Head shaking? Okay, thanks for a few of you for actually shaking your head. Dear God, Dear God help our community, help our community. Know, your love. know your love, heal them, heal them. of what? Humility. 
It's not about more faith. The reality check is more faith isn't your bulletproof solution for better prayers, for a better life as a Christian. It's not about increasing it. But also there is what others demand for us. Because others can demand that we have to have more faith. Others can demand that our faith has to be quantifiable by the number of times we come to worship service, by how hard we pray, if we even trust in prayer, and that can be very demoralizing. Author K.J. Ramsey says, if you've been taught to try harder to believe, but your chest still pounds with anxiety, your heart still sinks with depression, and your mind is flooded with fear, Please hear that God speaks peace over every part of you. Healing does not require slapping scripture on your scars. It's not only unfair, but unfaithful to our brothers and sisters in Christ to demand more faith from us so that it's quantifiable, so that we can see it and experience their faith. But what does Jesus say? Jesus responds to the disciples' inquiry and asking for an increase of faith. It's by laying out the essentials for cultivating a life of strong faith. First, that it only comes through practice. And it's the quality of faith, not the quantity. Because faith, the size of a mustard seed, is sufficient even for the most demanding tasks of discipleship. It's about the power of faith, not the quantity. We and the disciples are asking the wrong question. Rather, we should ask, how do I better embody my faith? How is it I better do what you, Jesus, are asking me to do? It's not about reward or gain. It's about doing what you're supposed to do. See the end of the gospel. How do I, with whatever measure of faith I have, live out what I'm called to do? Martin Luther calls this a vocation. We are each called to a vocation, whether that is to be a teacher, a banker, a farmer, or whatever else we are called in each of our doings to live out our faith in that. Luther says that a faith that faith does not stop to ask if good works are to be done, but is busy and active, always doing good for our neighbor. And that's what living out your vocation is, living out what God has called you to do. Because, as Luther puts it, we are a priesthood of believers, all called to live out our faith in all that we do some called to be farmers, some teachers, and so on. But as the priesthood of all believers, we're all called to preach. Some are just called to do it in a professional setting because we're not afraid of public speaking. You guys really don't laugh when I try to insert a joke in there. A little stone-faced this morning. In the second Timothy, Lois and Eunice are remembered as having raised Timothy in the faith, just as a multitude of mothers and grandmothers have raised their children as Christians. Paul tells Timothy, I am grateful to God when I remember you constantly in my prayers day and night. How might us as a congregation more intentionally remember and lift up one another in prayer beyond the weekly prayers of intercession during our worship. Jesus declares, we have done only what we have ought to be done. Such humility is reflected by former President Jimmy Carter. Younger generations may not be familiar with his presidency from 1977 to 1981, in fact, I don't remember him at all as a president, but rather how he's depicted on different cartoons depicting popular people. 
but he is the oldest living president having turned 98 yesterday. He's well known for his humanitarian projects, which is what I have seen him in the media for, notably Habitat for Humanity. And although he's given it up in the last few years because of his health, he is remembered for his decades-long tradition of teaching Sunday school. One of his most famous quotes that he's often uh, singled out for is, I have one life and one chance to make it count for something. My faith demands that I do whatever I can, wherever I am, whenever I can, for as long as I can, with whatever I have to try to make a difference. No matter your political beliefs, this is a strong conviction of faith to live into a vocational calling to serve the Lord. Jesus says, even with a little bit of faith, faith the size of a mustard seed, it is indeed faith, and we can do good and serve the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us sing together our hymn of the day, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, in the Cranberry Red Hymnal 759.
Give it thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. Fulfilling the promise of the resurrection, you pour out your fire of your own spirit, uplifting in one body people of every nation and tongue. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with the earth and sea and all our creatures, with the angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join in our unending hymn.
blood of Christ shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. by the body and blood of our Lord and Savior. We lift up this prayer. God of the abundant table, you have refreshed our hearts in this meal with the bread and for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we may serve our neighbors with joy for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. As you are able, please stand. Here, receive and believe this blessing. God Almighty, God most merciful, bless us, keep us, and give us peace. Amen. We joyfully sing our sending hymn, hymn number 535 in the Cranberry Red Hymnal. <clears throat> Serve the Lord. <laughs> <laughs>